Okay, so this is our second video tutorial, and today we're going to look at other methods of finding the distance of stars. In the last video, we looked at how to find the distance of a star based on Vines' law and uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law. Today we're going to be looking at parallax and redshift. So, a long time ago, astronomers noticed a very strange thing. Some stars seem to oscillate, they seem to move backwards and forwards just like they have here. Um, and that was originally quite difficult for them to understand. It didn't really make any logical sense why a star should move backwards or forwards across the sky. Um, but being scientists, people sat down and they tried different uh, geometric models, and they came up with an explanation. And this diagram on the right here shows the rough explanation. What they discovered is that our nearest stars, the stars that are closest to us, they will appear to move against a backdrop of distant stars. So if we look at the position of the, of the Earth in July, in its orbit around the Sun, then if we follow the line of sight, then this star appears to appears among some distant stars over on the left-hand side. Half a year later, in January, the line of sight is now slightly different, and it appears against very distant stars to be on the right-hand side. So if you look at the views of the stars, in January it appears on one side of the sky, in July it appears on a different side. Now it's really important to realise that this dif distance is absolutely tiny, it's very difficult to really notice. But you can get an idea of how this works. If you hold your finger up to your eye, and you close one eye, and then open the other one, and then swap over the eyes, you'll see your finger start to move. And it's the same principle here. These stars are far away, so they don't appear to move. This star is close, and because it's close, it appears to move against these stars. Uh, now, if you look at the very simple geometric diagram that we've got, we can create a right-angled triangle for this, where we have the Earth-Sun distance, and we have the distance to the star. And then we'll have an angle between the star and the angle to the Earth, which we're going to call theta. Uh, it's actually surprisingly difficult to find the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so we took a little uh, shortcut and we came up with the astronomical unit, or AU, and that's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. It also came up with another useful tool that's only ever makes sense in astronomy, uh, called the Parsec. And the idea of parsec is the parsec is a distance that gives a parallax of one second of arc. So this is the parallax angle here. It's the angle between the hypotenuse and the sun-star distance. Uh, somebody in my lesson actually asked, what well, does that mean then that we're calculating the distance from the sun to the star or from the earth to the star? Excellent question. The fact is, on the scale that we're talking about, they're the same. Uh, the Earth is, th this, this angle is so tiny that effectively D is the same as the hypotenuse, so we don't really need to worry about the distance. Certainly by the optical instruments that we have, you wouldn't see a distance. Um, so you should be able to see that just with some very basic trigonometry, uh, we can say that tan of theta, remember this is theta up here, is going to be equal to the opposite over the adjacent, which means it's 1 AU divided by tan of theta. Um, if you can work out what an astronomical unit is in meters, and you can work out this angle in degrees or radians, whatever you say you calculate it to, hey presto, you found the distance to a star. And this is probably the most easily directly measurable way of finding the distance to a star. This is simple geometry, we know it works. It's a pretty good way of finding the distance to a star. So thinking back to the last lesson, that then means that we can now use the parallax method to find the distance of our close stars. Then we've got a definite understanding of the distance. We know it's right. So we can plug that into the Stefan Boltzmann law. If we plug that into Stefan Boltzmann's law, we can find their true luminosity. Now, Vines' law is pretty good. We know their real temperature. Now, what that means is we can work out the size, the area of each spectral class of star. And that's very, very important because with that information, we can now give a really good idea of the surface area, and thus luminosity, for stars that are too far away. We can now say, if we think back to Obia, Fine Girl, Kiss Me, the different definitions of stars, 
the different spectral classes, we can say if you're a class O star, all class O stars are roughly this size. And there's other ways, remember, that are beyond the scope of A-level, uh, all to do with the spectrum stars that define their spectral class. But because we can now work out the size of every spectral class, if we know the spectral class of a star we're interested in, we can get its luminosity, and then even if it's too far away to use the parallax method, we can use the inverse square law to say, well, their luminosity is x, the flux, the radiant flux intensity on Earth is y, inverse square law says that therefore the distance must be this. And that's really, really powerful. But it's not the only method we have of finding the distance of stars. These two pictures are of the same patch of night sky. You can see that the nebula around here hasn't changed. Uh, this is what a star looked like one night of observation. This is what it looked like the day after. Those of you who are in the know will recognize this as a supernova. Um, and supernovas are really important because we can see supernovas in distant galaxies, and they enable us to start thinking about the distance of different galaxies. Um, so some galaxies contain objects where we can really accurately predict the luminosity. And the example you see in this photo here is such a type. This is a type 1a supernova. Now, a type 1a supernova isn't really necessary for your course, but it's really, really fascinating. It basically exists when you have a binary star system. So there are two stars orbiting each other. And one of those stars dies and becomes a white dwarf. The other star, however, stays alive. Now, what will happen is matter from the living star will start to be spiraling in to the dead star, to the white dwarf. So the white dwarf will start to pick up clouds and clouds of hydrogen gas. And the hydrogen will become denser and denser and denser. Now, if you think back to when we did the evolution of stars, that should be a pretty good clue of what happens next. If we have matter spiraling into a star, eventually fusion's going to start. This is what happens when the fusion starts. We build up so much matter so quickly that the core of the white dwarf ignites all that matter. I say ignite, obviously it's fusion. And we get a massive burst of energy. What's really useful for us, though, is we know that it takes a certain mass of hydrogen to be accumulated in order for that process to start. We can also work out and predict how bright that would be what that luminosity is. And because the fusion has to start at a certain mass, we know it has to always have a certain matter, sorry, a certain brightness, a certain luminosity. Now, if that means that we've got this known luminosity. We know that wherever we see a type 1a supernova, it doesn't matter where it is in the universe, it's going to be the same brightness. So once again, if we know the brightness, we can plug it back into the inverse square law, we can get the distance. An astronomer that did this, his name was Edwin Hubble, um, and he noticed that the light from distant galaxies was redshifted. They were all moving away from us, so this could be the emission line of hydrogen in a young star. And he saw that this is what it should look like. This is what it looks like on Earth. But all the galaxies that he looked at were redshifted. The bands were all there, but they were at longer wavelength. And that's due to the Doppler effect. Now, this is a rough approximate equation for the Doppler effect. We give Doppler shift the value z, and it's the change in wavelength divided by the original wavelength. And it so happens, for various boring reasons, um, it's equivalent to, well, roughly equivalent to velocity over the speed of light. There's a more accurate version of this equation that you might find online, but for A-level at Excel, uh, it's not necessary. So what Hubble did is he looked at the distance of different galaxies, well, type 1a supernovae, but they appeared in different galaxies, and he looked at their velocity from the redshift, and he plotted them on a graph, and you can see that's a pretty damn good correlation. The further away a galaxy appears, the faster it's traveling. And this is one of the most important astronomical finds ever, because this is one of the biggest pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. He came up with this very simple equation. The velocity of anything in the universe is equal to a constant times its distance. Um, now, because this is an observational constant, you can see this comes out of 
just looking at the stars and plotting a graph, unlike pretty much anything else in physics, we have to measure this. And unlike anything else in physics, like the speed of light, which, okay, yeah, we have to measure it, but it also falls out of Maxwell's equations, we can only get it experimentally, or I should say observationally, we're not actually moving the stars. So you'll find lots of different values for the Hubble constant. Uh, this one here, 67.8 kilometers per second per megaparsec, that's the most widely accepted value. Uh, it's from the Planck survey, which is the most accurate we believe we have. But obviously, depending on which stars you survey, you'll get slightly different values. Now, what's really interesting about the Hubble's law is it tells us that the universe must have come from a single point, and that's a really good piece of evidence for the Big Bang. If the universe is expanding, anywhere we look, the further away it is, the faster it's going, that means that at some point, it must have been really, really small, and it's got bigger. So that's a big piece of evidence for the Big Bang. Now, because the universe is blowing apart, we know that gravity is trying to pull it back in. So on your exam, you may be asked what will happen to the universe at the end of time. Um, and there are three basic possibilities. There could be a big crunch. Big crunch would be if gravity is strong enough to slow down the universe, so at the moment it's accelerating away, but could it eventually slow down and then be pulled back in? Um, presumably it would become one enormous black hole then with all the matter in the universe. This is currently the best idea. People seem to think this is what will happen. Endless expansion. That means that the universe will just keep expanding and keep expanding until there's an infinite distance between everything. Uh, or there's also a steady state theory. And now you may have heard about dark matter. Uh, what we're seeing is that the rate of the universe expanding is lower than it should be. If we look at all the stars, we can add up what they should all weigh and work out what the force of gravity between everything should be. And it's not right. The universe is expanding too quickly. And there are a couple of theories about what that could be. One theory is there's dark matter holding the universe together. So matter that we can't weigh, that we can't see, but seems to make things weigh slightly more. Or there could there have been some other exotic hypotheses that look at dark energy. So there could be energy popping up in the middle of the universe and pushing stars apart. Um, but you'll find a lot more information about that in your textbook. This is just one of those things you just have to learn and memorize.